I kind of got a hover today. Uh, but my friend Chris Callen from Psychosource Magazine and Source Media is going to sit up here and engage in this. I'd like to watch as much of this as I can, uh, but I might have to duck out. But Chris cool. from Psychosource Magazine, who's covered this show every year and, and gives us great publicity, great support. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the phone, the Lord, repost, what's going on? <laughs> I thought, I gotta hear what's going on. And then the more I thought, well, I got a show, and I bet a lot of people would like to hear what's going on. And uh, I called Charlie up about this, and uh, Charlie said, I, I don't speak in front of crowds. Uh, it's kind of old. And I said, don't worry, man. Missouri just legalized weed. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, probably the question everybody's going to ask right off the bat is like, where where did this idea even start? How do you how do you because you've done in, incredible trips on your motorcycle, you've been mm -hmm. on your motorcycle. There's nothing you'd rather be doing. Yeah. Than ride, no matter what what the weather or anything, but how do you sit down and go, you know what? I'm going to go around the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, for me, I, you know, I, I had already done so much around the United States and a, a ton around Europe as well. And um, I think for me, it was sort of the next big trip. You know, I sit back and I say, what's, like, what's the ultimate? What's the biggest thing you can do on a motorcycle? It, it's go all the way around the world. And, um, and like you said, the, the trip started at kind of a weird time because we were right in the middle of the COVID, a lot of lockdowns and a lot of questions about even being able to get onto an airplane and all this stuff. And so, you know, I left the trip feeling a little tentative, kind of knowing that I would just kind of take it one step at a time. I was like, well, I got three months in the US before I even need to be in Europe. So I'll start by going to Mexico and then I'll do coast to coast across the US and actually ended up in Seattle, then back down to Miami. And, uh, and then at that point, things were kind of starting to shake loose a little bit. Um, so I went ahead and transported the bike then from Miami to Amsterdam. And then when I did that, uh, 
I was feeling okay with the, with the COVID situation, you know, I was still a little concerned about some countries being open and how I'd get into them. Um, but I figured I would just deal with it when I got there. Um, and then it turned out that that actually was like the least of my worries. Because uh, then that's when Russia then attacked Ukraine. And then all of a sudden now that was an issue. And which then of course raised the big question of, well, how do I do a true round the world ride without going through Russia? Because at the point, at that time, I didn't know if it was an option. Um, Cause I was getting all kinds of mixed, uh, mixed answers when it came to whether or not the, the border was open. Um, and now, so my original plan was to go from Amsterdam to Baca de Roca, Portugal, which is right outside of Lisbon. And that's the westernmost point of Europe that you can get to by, on land anyway. There's a, if you really want to argue it, there's an island off coast. Um, so I get to Amsterdam and I'm still like, I don't really know what's happening. I guess I'll just putz around Europe for a while because it's still kind of early in the year to be headed that far east anyway. So I go ahead and kind of stick with my original plan, go down to Baca de Roca and uh, immediately turn around, go back north. Um, and originally the intention was to go north into Sweden, loop into Finland, and then enter Russia through Finland. But I, I did have some pretty good intel that that border was closed, closed. Um, first hand, uh, you know, people that have gone there and tried and they weren't getting through. So pretty quickly I had to kind of redirect. And when you look on a map, there's only two options that really to get into Russia. I mean, without Belarus or Ukraine, right? Which were a hard no at that point. So Finland off the table, pretty much all of Eastern Europe access was off the table and they're really only left going through Georgia. So I started going through all the Balkan countries and work my way over to Georgia and up in Tbilisi. And um, I go to Tbilisi, I see a friend of mine, stay with him for about a week and uh, we say our goodbyes and I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this. So the, board, the, the Russian border from, from, his, from his house to the border is about 100 miles. So I pack up, like I said, say our goodbyes and head up there and it's a beautiful ride. You get up into the Caucasus, in the Caucasus Mountains, it's incredible, really beautiful up there. Get to the border and of course they look at my American passport and they look at me and they're like, yeah, no, this, this, isn't, <laughs> this isn't happening, sorry. So I'm like, oh, come on. There's gotta be something like, I'm just a tourist coming in. And they're like, no, hard no, not coming in. So turn around and go back to Tbilisi and uh, turns out there's actually a considerable amount of world travelers that are stuck there. Because when you get into Georgia, your only real options to continue east are northern Russia, which was closed, uh, going to Azerbaijan and catch the ferry across the Caspian Sea to Turkmenistan. Azerbaijan is closed, so, so that's not an option, which, which is unfortunate because that would have been pretty cool. Um, or go south through Iran, um, which is not a great option either. And, and for me personally, that wasn't an option at all because you can only get into Iran, obviously you have to have a visa but you can only get a visa from your home country. And I never intended on going to Iran, so I didn't have a visa. I would have had to fly back to the States to get that, and that wasn't gonna happen. Um, so what I ended up doing was uh, I, I found this guy in Holland who's basically a fixer, and um, sent him my paperwork. He sends all that paperwork uh, to the FSB in Moscow which is a little ner pretty nerve wracking in and of itself, because that's basically handing your passport and everything to them, saying, here's who I am, here's what I'm doing, here's what I hope to enter, you know? And of course, at the time, I'm thinking, I want to, I want to get in, but as quietly as possible. Um, that didn't work out. So, so anyway, I get this piece of paperwork, 
and uh, I really have no idea what, what it says. It's all in Russian, I can't read it. So I, I've got my, my Google Translate app out, I'm looking at it, you know, and this guy in Holland, he tells me what's on it and kind of briefs me, coaches me on how to handle this when I now go back. He's like, yeah, okay, so when you go there, he's like, just tell them you're going to the region of Yerevan, which I had to Google where that was. <laughs> and, you know, I have no idea. And uh, he's like, yeah, so you're gonna tell them that you're, you're a, a dairy farm mechanic and you're, you have to go to this farm to fix a dairy separator, which I also had to Google what that was. You know, I'm like, what the hell's a dairy separator? Right, just in case you're asked questions. Right, just in case you're at the, I'm like, well, how many questions are they gonna ask me? He's like, eh, not many, probably, it'd be real easy. We've done this before. I'm like, well, how many times before? Oh, like six or eight. Like, it's not really that many, but whatever, okay. He's like, it'll be fine, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, you'll get in. I like, okay, all right, sounds good. So I, uh, I go to the border, Again, hand him my passport, and they're the same reaction, like, what are you doing here? And, uh, and in fact, when I left Georgia, because you have to process out of one country before you can process into the next, right? So I process out of Georgia, and there's like three miles of the worst road you've ever seen in your life between Georgia and Russia, because I don't think anybody maintains it. And you have to go through like the, like the tunnel of death to get over there, it's horrible. Um, they actually questioned me too, because they look at the stamps on my passport and they're like, dude, you just left and re-entered like three weeks ago. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going back to Russia, I'm gonna try again. And they're like, well, what's changed? I'm like, oh, I got this permit. And they're like, yeah, okay, dude, whatever. We'll see you in an hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, all right, whatever, let's just do this. So I go back and yeah, so I handed it, so now I hand him this paperwork and they give it a double take, like, like where'd you get this? What is this? I'm like, it's my special entry permit. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we parked yourself on this bench over here. So I sit down, I'm sitting there for maybe an hour and then this like a more official looking guy comes out and uh, he waves me over and makes me follow him up to this real scary little concrete room with cameras and stuff on it, and a picture of Putin hanging on the wall. And I'm thinking like, this is like, this, this is like the start of a movie. <laughs> like, or the end of a movie, like this, the chances of this ending well are, are getting more and more slim, right? And I'm starting to get like really nervous. I'm starting to sweat, I'm like, oh man. This is, I'm like, man, where's Liam Neeson right now to come break me out of this, you know? So, I'm just sitting there. And he starts asking me questions. He's got his computer pulled up. And he starts grilling me about this permit. I'm like, where'd you get this? And uh, like, who do you know? And who's this guy who gave this for you? And he gave this to you. And I'm feeding him, feeding him these answers as best I can, a lot of which I don't know. Because he's like, who do you work for? Like, he wants to know the name of the mechanic company that I work for. I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm like, oh, it's this. And I just like point to something on the paper. Like, I don't even know what I'm pointing at. So I was making this whole thing up and just trying to like give like like the most benign answer I can possibly give them, right? And just like avoiding these questions as best I can. And then uh, he finally kind of moves on, luckily past that. And then he starts asking me questions about uh, like me and family stuff and like, you know, do you have military background? Do you know how to fire a weapon? He asked me if I, know, if I know how to ride a horse, which I thought was strange. No, not really. Um, then he starts asking me uh, about the, the climate of the United States. Like, well, how are things in the US? And how's life there? How's the economy? And I feel bad about it, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm like, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Because I'm thinking like, <laughs> he doesn't want to know that everything's fine, right? So I'm just giving him answers I think he wants to hear at this point. <laughs> like, oh, life in the U.S. is horrible. Like, our economy's going to hell. Like, it's, it's all going down the toilet. Because, like, you know, I'm thinking he wants to hear this, right? So finally, he, uh, this goes on for an hour and a half or so, maybe two hours. Um, and so finally he gets up. He's like, yeah, okay, you're free to go. 
But at this point, like, I don't really know, like, what direction. <laughs> so I have to ask him. I'm like, like, free to go, like, back to Georgia or go into Russia? He's like, no, you can go into Russia. I'll stamp your passport. Oh, sweet. Okay. Like, right on, man. <laughs> okay. So I scurry out to my bike. I'm like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> well, it turns out I only had to move my bike about 20 feet because then I had to process the motorcycle in. Oh, I didn't really think about that part. I was so worried about not getting thrown in jail. So uh, this, this woman helps me. She can, she can tell I have no idea what I'm doing because they hand me this paperwork to fill out. And again, it's all in Russian. I can't read it. I have no idea what it says. But anyway, get it all filled out and um, roll, into, roll into Russia. The whole thing took three or four hours maybe. But yeah. Just three or four hours of every minute seems like... Terrifying. Terrifying, yeah. Talk, talk about that for a minute, though, because other than the fact that, like, if you're going to completely circumnavigate the world, obviously you have to travel through some part of Russia. Russia kind of have to, to. yeah. But it was. This is also a, a crucial part of your trip too, because you stepped on objectives for the that you, there were things that you wanted to do. You had to get into Russia. So right. At the time, we saw all this going on with you. We were at home. We're all like, "Oh my God, if he doesn't get in, this is disaster." It would have been the end of the road. Yeah. I would have had to reschedule for like five years from now. Yeah. What were, what were some of the things along the line that you were waiting for once you got, once you got across the border? Oh, man. I mean, I mean, really, once I got in, then at that point, it was just, the, you know, the next objective was just to make it across and make it to either Vladivostok or Magadan. And... Um, the original plan had always been to go to Magadan because I wanted to do the Road of Bones. I wanted to do this road, um, which I knew was highly questionable on that motorcycle. <laughs> like, I knew in reality it was like the opposite motorcycle of what you should really be taking there, you know. But now, for those I don't, you don't know. know this cat, he has a fantastic adventure bike. He really well, not anymore. I sold it. Did you? Yeah. But I did. He, he's had this fantastic adventure bike, and still, you'll see him on, this, on these type of roads on that motorcycle. Was it 2000, 2003 was Twin Cam was your bike? Yeah, yeah. 2003 Twin Cam that's over in the other room. It's 20 feet long, and he rides it. I've, I've been in the canyons in Colorado with him. He rides it like his ass is on fire. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, actually, though. So, so yeah, I had a BMW GS. A pretty new one too. I mean, the bike that's supposedly built for for the road of bones, for that kind of stuff, right? So one of the days I was on that on that road, I was maybe three or four days into it, and uh, I come across a couple riding two up on a GS twelve hundred, and um, they're from Moscow, and they were doing the same ride to Magadan, and because um, it's a popular ride for Russians, and so. I come across this couple. I'm parked on the side of the road. They pull over and we visit for a minute and they take off down the road. They're, they're moving 10 times faster than I'm moving. They're actually going the speed limit. I'm just trying to survive. <laughs> and get further down the road and I see him. They're pulled over. He's got his wheel taken off. He's blowing out a wheel bearing. So pretty damn creatively, actually, he found a log that he whittled down to the shape of a bearing hammered his axle through it and was like, this is going to have to work because out there, there's no shops. I mean, you have to figure this stuff out. So I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool, actually. Let's see how this works. Takes off down the road and we get moving again. And uh, this particular section of road that we were on, it's actually one of these photos that popped up. It has my bike propped up on a log because I had broken a final drive belt. Um, had these rocks that were just super loose and they're real sharp. And I, mis I made the mistake, and I, apparently he did too, of, of moving too fast. Because if you got going too, too quick, these rocks are sort of swinging all over the place. So you really had to keep your speed down on this. And that was the day I broke that final drive belt and the day that he, one of those rocks, punched a hole through his engine case. And that 
bike never made it to Magadan. It went home on a truck. They had it shipped all the way back. So the Olympic bike didn't make it to Southern Bay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. But when you talk about this kind of this kind of travel, the mechanical failure is very possible. Yeah. You know, how do you how do you account for that? How do you plan for, for what you might face there? What did you have with you? How did you I mean I had I had tons of spare parts with me. And then of course all the tools to replace everything I could think to replace, right? So there's only so much there's only so much you can do. You know, if you destroy, you know, destroy your motor and, you know, crack a piston or break a frame. Well, even some of that you can weld that together, I guess, but um, like I had a complete charging system with me, almost a complete primary with me, wheel bearings, neck bearings, plugs, cables, uh, spare lengths of uh, oil line, about 300 zip ties, duct tape. I mean, like it, it, tubes, tire levers, pumps, patches, everything you could possibly imagine. And um, surprisingly, I didn't actually use most of it. Um, luckily, you know, but sure, shit, if I didn't have it, I wouldn't need it, right? <laughs> but yeah, there's only so much planning you can do. I mean, you, you like I, I've had this bike for so long, I, I know the weak points, you know, I know the things that have been known to fail. Um, Ironically though, the one thing that I did have legitimate problems with was the starter. And I didn't have a single spare part for a starter. Yeah. Like not, you know. Yeah. But what are you gonna do? Carry a whole entire starter with you? Well they could have. This is one of those situations where it doesn't matter if you're a prime member of Amazon, like <laughs> Yeah, you're not getting a part. Yeah, yeah, your kid has ordered something, and plus you're in Russia anyway, so that option to have something shipped in isn't there. Yeah. You can't use your credit cards. Like your cash only, because of all the sanctions. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the other actually challenge of that was, um, you know, when I was, you know, like when I was still in Georgia trying to get in, I was also trying to figure out how to pay for everything once I got in, because it would be cash only. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening was that luckily my buddy there, um, I was going to ATMs every day for like four days, pulling out as much as I could until my bank would shut it off. And then I'd have to call the bank, be like, it's cool, turn it back on, do the same thing again. Just pulling out as much cash as I could. And then I was borrowing, you know, not borrowing, but he'd give me cash, his girlfriend would give me cash, his girlfriend's dad gave me cash, and I'd PayPal them, you know, to square it up. So then I ended up with like this pile of Georgian lorries, I think it is, which I then now had to take to every currency exchange place in town to get it all exchanged for rubles. So that was four days right there. Just trying to collect enough rubles and then thinking like, well, how much am I gonna need? Because I need this much for gas, this much maybe for lodging, food. Then I gotta pay for shipping in cash to get the bike out. I gotta get a plane ticket to get myself out, which then led to like, well, how am I gonna pay for a plane ticket? Because can't pay cash for a plane ticket. I mean, that's all. I ended up finding somebody in Magadan who bought the ticket for me and I just gave them cash. But, because there was that, you know, that, that whole dynamic of like, once I'm in, there was no way to get more money. So my backup plan was to drop into Kazakhstan or Mongolia to hit an ATM and then come back up, which luckily I never had to do because I almost had to deal with that border crossing again. You know, and that was, uh, that was one of the things when we were following along with you that you really didn't have a plan. Like you said, you, you prepared for as many things as you could, and you, you figured it out as you went. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a lot of variables there. Like, and you, you kind of, it seems like you couldn't really have a plan. No. You, you sort of had to let yourself go through it. Yeah, I really just kind of had, I was, I was kind of moving with the season, you know, like, I knew that I had a six to eight week window in 
northeast Russia where it wasn't going to be snowing. So, and there's the wet season, of course, too. I mean, you, d you definitely don't want to be out here in the wet season, although that's actually in Spain. That was a road I shouldn't have been on either, <laughs> actually. Well, I, yeah, well, <laughs> well, I had seen a sign with a, with a camera on it, so I just assumed there was some overlook. There was actually an overlook. It was really pretty. I don't know if it was worth the road to get up there. It was treacherous. Almost got stuck up there, actually. Yeah. That, that seems to strike me. That's, uh... Yeah. I think that was like Montenegro or Macedonia or something. Charlie, you talked about some of the dark days on the road. If I need to catch you on those dark days, I can get through those. Yeah. You're on the road a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it does get hard, man, because it's like, you know, when you're, you know, like Western Europe, for example, is basically the United States with a different language. It's all pretty polished and it's pretty easy and most people speak English, like it's not really that big of a deal. Um, but when you start getting further and further east, you know, like you get into the Balkan countries and now all of a sudden language becomes an issue. Um, and so, I mean, you can use Google Translate, a lot of pointing and gesturing and you kind of you can get through it, right? But you're not really having a conversation. And, which is fine for a little while, but after months of that, after a while, you're like, man, I just wanna like talk to somebody. And I'm not even a talker. I'm, surpri I'm surprised I'm talking this much right now, actually. So, I mean, it, it does get tough. And, and it's exhausting. Because, I mean, it'll take half an hour to get through what should be a five-minute conversation. Because both, both people are on the phones, translating everything back and forth. And it doesn't always translate correctly. So now you're trying to do it multiple times, using different wording, they're trying to get it to go. Then you kind of show it to them, like, does this make sense? No. Or they'll show me something, I'm like, I don't think that's what you mean to say. <laughs> I mean, that's hilarious, but I don't think that's what you meant. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, eh. Yeah, I don't think so. Well, what, what was it that gets you through those? I mean, because I know, I know yeah. sometimes where it's just like, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, it does get exhausting sometimes. And sometimes you just have to take a day off. I mean, like for me, sometimes I'll take a day off the bike and just like avoid interaction with people. I'll just go grab my camera, wander around a city somewhere where, you know, where people aren't gonna just come to you because you just kind of blend in with everybody else and just take in the sites and check out the little shops and stuff like that. And um, you kind of have to do that because you can't be on the bike every day. It's too much. It's exhausting. So what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you that one. <coughs> sure. I, I read you went on a trip with the GPS, but yeah. how many times did you check your rest up? Because I know I've been in Wyoming on gravel roads and you were questioning whether or not you're even on the right freaking road. Right, yeah. So what, typically what I'll, what I'll do, like my kind of daily routine is that in the, in the evenings when I've, when I've gotten to wherever I'm going, whether it be a campsite or a hostel or a hotel or somebody's house, um, I plan out the next day. So I never really know where I'm going until the night before. And then, so, you know, I usually start with Google Maps, actually. I'll open that first and figure out what direction I even want to go and think about like, well, how far do I want to go? Like if I'm tired, maybe I'll just pick a place that's 100, 100 miles away. Right. And then I'll, then I'll find a, an actual stopping point, like a campground or a hotel or at the actual place I want to end up that next day. <clears throat> and then, and this is, a, this is the part I always think is the most fun, is find my route b between the two. And, um, I always try to find the most obscure route as possible. Like just keep zooming in, zooming in, zooming in until the roads keep popping up until they don't pop up anymore. And because um, the smaller the road, the better, you know, in my opinion. And then I can turn a hundred or 150 mile a day into like an all day trip. But every once in a while you end up on those roads and you're like, I'm not sure this is really a road. <laughs> Because sometimes, like, literally, I end up on a dirt two-track across a field. <laughs> I'm like, is this going to go anywhere? 
And, you know, you start to question, like, how far down this do I go before I give up and turn around? Because I could, could end up like at a creek, and then that's the end of it. But nine times out of ten, it would go somewhere. It would pop out at a paved road or something. Like, okay. But, um, but what's cool, though, because then you end up on these roads that most people don't drive. You know, you end up on these roads that are just completely decimated, and there's, like, bushes growing in over, half over it, and there's like weeds growing out of the middle of it. And you're thinking like, man, I don't think anybody's been down this road in three weeks. But you end up in this really cool places. Cause you know, they always inevitably will pop you into some little village that's like incredible. You're like, look at this little place. And they have like a little cafe and you pull over and get a coffee and pretend to be able to talk to somebody in French, you know? How many countries did you hit in that 300 Yeah. Uh, Twenty-eight, maybe, I think. Did you go into China, or how did that? Did no, you go no. Uh, where did you go after you went? Once I got into Russia, I really wanted to stay there because getting in was so difficult that I didn't want, want to have to deal with a border again. Um, China would be tough too. is difficult, even in the best conditions. Um, originally, I wanted to go into Kazakhstan and Mongolia. Uh, so my, originally, I was going to come out of you know. A, well, depending on what direction I had come from. Either way, I wanted to drop into Kazakhstan and Mongolia. But the, it was, like I said, it was so hard to get in that once I crossed that border, I was like, I'm just going to stay, stay in Russia. And, and how does it go from, like, like Australia? Or how do, you, how do you do that part of it? I uh, didn't go down to Australia. So, so, okay, so you went from Russia to Mexico. Back to Mexico. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Uh, I chose it because it's what I own. Uh, I've had it for 17 years. So, I don't know. Most of them are like a little confused. They're, yeah, they're just kind of blown away by the whole thing. Because it's not like you don't see Harleys in Russia. They are there. There's not a, a lot of them, but they are, they are there. It's mostly Japanese bikes. Um, and then, yeah, they were pretty so blown away. Yeah, it definitely turns a lot of heads. And then, of course, there's a lot of checkpoints. Once you're in, then there's checkpoint after checkpoint after checkpoint. And the further east you get, there's fewer and fewer of them. But at first, there's a lot of them, especially especially uh, going between Ukraine and Kazakhstan. You had that corridor you have to get through. Um, so there, you know, you'd be coming down the road and there'd just be a wall of tanks and trucks. Hey, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd pull up and it's just the same routine every time. They look at your passport and be like, what are you doing here? Like, like literally everybody's leaving and you're coming in. Like every American in Russia is actively hunting for a plane ticket to get out of here. Like, what are you doing here? Um, but, you know, they could, it's obvious I'm a, just a tourist. Whether they agreed with what I was doing or not, didn't matter. I was obviously. Did you ever get question whether or not you were a potential spy or anything? No. Really? Were the Russians nice overall? They seemed like they were nice. Extremely nice. Very nice. And, yeah, and that was because it's sort of an interesting dynamic of the trip, is that, uh, in my mind, once I, once I got in, I anticipated the next two to three months to be very solo and very alone and very much on my own. That's what I expected. I thought once I cross this border, I'm just gonna be, like, I'm not gonna have to talk to anybody until I leave. That's, that's what I expected, you know? And uh, it, it just, the, the polar opposite. The polar opposite. So, so I had a uh, Erzy, Erzy MC is a club in Magas, which is right outside of Vladikavkaz, which is right across the border. Uh, and I had been talking to them for at least a month. They knew I was coming. We had been talking back and forth. And uh, they, the first time I went to the border, they already had guys that they had sent to the border waiting for me. Of course, I get rejected, and I go back, and then they're like, "We'll stay in touch. Let's, you know, let's stay in touch about this." So, 
I go back, and same thing. They sent three guys down to the border, and they're just sitting, waiting for me. So when I cross the border, it, immediately I'm greeted by this local club. And uh, luckily, they actually spoke pretty good English. Um, so they take me, you know, we say our hellos, we're all excited to see each other, you know, because it's been kind of a long haul. And uh, so I follow them to their town of Magas, which is a really unique place. Uh, I didn't realize that that whole area of Russia is very Muslim, so there's a lot of mosques. Um, it's a really beautiful area. Anyway, they put me up in this like really swank hotel, and they take me out to eat, and, it, and I'm, I keep trying to like pay them for the hotel and food, and they're like, no, no, no. No, you are a guest, nothing. Uh, they have a garage to put my motorcycle in, and they're I mean, driving me around, showing me things. So I spend three, uh, two or three days there, and I go to leave, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna call the guys with the Step Brotherhood MC, Step uh, S-T-E-P-P-E, -E, because they're going to cross the Great Step there which is like high desert, right? Um, so I go, okay, cool. Uh, that's up in Elista is the name of the town. So I leave Magas and I go across the steppe. It's this, this whole day adventure to get in this very remote, very interesting part of the world. Um, get to Elista, same thing. There's guys waiting for me, cool. And they're like, yeah, come with us. They have this beautiful clubhouse, bunch of beds in it, feed me dinner, bunch of people come visit. It turns out to be this big party. I get there and uh, I start to get sick. I'm really not feeling well. And um, like, I'm starting to go downhill pretty quick. I think it was a combination of just exhaustion, the stress of not knowing what's happening at the border and all the stuff that kind of like piled on top of itself. So, you know, they're starting to feel bad because I'm kind of a wreck, I can't do much. And they're trying to show me around, but I'm kind of like half in it. They ended up taking me to a local hospital, which is basically somebody's house. Um, <laughs> but they go there and they're, you know, they're all speaking Russian, I don't really know what's going on. But they gave me a prescription for some antibiotics and this stuff. So they drive and go get everything I need and again, just refused to let me pay. I'm like, I'm like, it's a hospital bill. Like, you gotta let me pay for this. And the prescriptions, like, come on. They're like, absolutely would not. So I ended up being there for three or four days. Finally start to feel better, decide to leave. And before I leave, they're like, yeah, 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 hang on. And they call ahead up to uh, Volgograd, which is the next place I'm going. Same thing. Get to Volgograd, somebody waiting for me. Put me up for the night. And this happens, like, like seriously, all the way across. To the point where it almost became overwhelming. And one night, I was like, I, I need a night off. Like, this is almost, <laughs> this is overwhelming, man. Like, I'm not this social. Like, I'm a loner. That's why I'm traveling by myself, you know? <laughs> so I ended up just, like, pulling over at this truck stop hotel and uh, got a room for seven bucks and um, stayed there for the night. And, um, and then the next morning, get up and start the whole thing over again. It was incredible. So it, it was just the, the opposite of what I expected, right? So the point is, the world appreciates you. And people are just like us, right? First thing you have is people who don't realize that. Yeah, that's exactly it, yeah. I mean, that, that people everywhere in the world, from all walks of life, speak all different languages in all different countries, they're all, they're all doing the same thing. Right. They get up in the morning, they go to work, and they're trying exactly. to keep food on the table, and somebody comes into their world that needs help. Actually, they might not even need help, but they want to give it to you anyway. Right. And in a lot of these countries, like, you don't say no. Like, you can't say no, because they're, they're, you know, they're just going to ignore you and give it to you anyway. <laughs> so. Right, yeah, depending on what it is. Some awkward situations in there. Uh, you got a belt on the front and back? I do. I did, yeah. I had a spare primary belt and a spare, yep, yeah, and all the tools to change it. Yeah, 
Yeah, one of these pictures will come up here with a bike propped up on a log when I broke a final drive belt. But. So for, for Man, that's always such a hard question to answer, <laughs> you know? Because um, I feel like there's just like an accumulation of small highlights all along the way that sort of make one big one, you know? But, you know, there's certain countries that I like, like Portugal. I had been to Portugal before, so going back was nice. I love that country, I think it's amazing. Um, Italy is pretty fantastic. Yeah, going through wine country and all those vineyards and all that stuff is pretty amazing. And of course, the Swiss Alps and Austria, it's like, I mean, you, ha you can't go wrong with that, right? Come on. Um, there were a couple countries that I hadn't been to that really kind of blew my mind, like Montenegro was uh, absurd, you know? Um, you know, like one of the things we're in, there's this amazing mountains and you come across this bridge and it's like, this bridge is huge. I'm coming across it, and I'm looking down, and like there's this massive canyon, and the water is like neon blue. And you're just like, how is this? Like, I don't even, I've never seen water like this. It's incredible. And that whole country is just, I mean, staggeringly beautiful. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> yeah. Where to next? Yeah. Milwaukee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your house. <laughs> where, where would you like to ride to next? I'm thinking, uh, I feel like the next two obvious ones would either be Alaska or South America. Or, or combine both into one big trip. But I don't know. So talk, just, just for the understanding, talk about the amount of miles. Because what do we have, like 3,500 miles? Yeah, that'd be like the longest way possible to do it even. So yeah, thirty basically 34,000 miles is what it ended up being. Um, so the American part of it was 10,000. Yeah, that's a pretty small part of it really. Yeah, and actually even, even Europe is so small, even that's kind of a fraction of it. Yeah. I mean, Russia alone was seven or 8,000 miles. Yeah, it's absurd, wow. absurdly. <laughs> Again, it's what I own. <laughs> it's fine, yeah. It's good. It's good. So, like the uh, story you were telling me about earlier, I feel like we should tell everybody a little more about when uh, you faced the mechanical breakdown of the starter. Oh, the starter, yeah. That was kind of a, that turned into a nightmare, actually, because uh, it had started to go. It, it had started to act up, and I knew, I knew it wasn't good. And like I said, that, that was like the one component that I had no spare parts for and no great way to deal with it. So um, I think it was in Krasnoyarsk when it finally was done. And uh, so pulled it apart and ended up basically at a salvage yard, stripping the guts out of a Honda Civic starter and um, basically had to sort of modify the starter housing a little bit to get it to work, but got the aperture in there, uh, tested it, you know, bench tested it, and it, sure enough, it worked. So I was like, oh, okay. So basically, just had to find a way then to make that aperture fit inside the housing correctly and get it all, because some of the, uh, like the posts were kind of in the wrong place, and there was some goofy stuff, but got it all back together, um, back on the bike, worked fine, and then, uh, I don't know, thousand-ish, couple thousand miles down the road, um, the bearing on the end of that aperture had kind of wallered out the cup that it presses into. So again, it's like, oh, man, take this thing back apart, took a little piece of a Red Bull can, kind of wrapped it around that bearing and jammed the whole thing back together. But for a day or two, um, in fact, there was one day the bike never, never got turned off. Because trying to get it restarted was a total nightmare. Mm -hmm. So I just left it running the entire day. Really? Yeah. It was like, yeah. It probably ran for 10 hours straight. Because yeah. mm -hmm. what are you going to do? 
you know? And then, of course, we, you know, pole started it at one time using a, a toe strap, wrapped it around, wrapped it around the primary. And Ninety-eight percent of it. Do you prefer to travel that way? Yeah, I do. It's really nice, you know, because I linked up. Basically, I linked up with Anton, which is a guy from Crimea. So Anton, well, actually in Krasnoyarsk, when I was dealing with that starter, is when I met this guy named Anton. He was traveling on this. Uh, okay, so I was staying at this bike post, which is like a hostel for bikers. They're all along, all the way through Russia. They're incredible. Um, that's where I was messing with the starter. So I was there for a couple of days. This guy, this guy pulls in on this two-stroke two Russian-built EJ. So it's I-Z-H. It's an EJ Jupiter 5. I mean, this is a steaming pile of crap. <laughs> and so he's got this bike with this home-built trailer attached to it. This whole contraption, you're like, I mean, I kind of loved it, you know, because like, I'm like, man, this, this is just as dumb of a motorcycle as mine is. Like, this is kind of awesome. But we, we don't really talk too much, um, but I overheard that he was going to Magadan. And uh, so to back up a little bit, I, like I said earlier, my, my original goal was to always either go to Magadan or Vladivostok. And I told myself I would only do Magadan if I could find somebody to ride with because I knew that that was pretty ambitious to tackle solo. Um, and if I couldn't find anybody, I'd go to Vladivostok. Still on the Pacific Ocean, still the Far East, as far as, it's still the end of the road, but it's paved the whole way, right? Which kind of would have sucked to go that way, because as a guy in Magadan said, only the wusses go to Vladivostok, and the, and the real bikers go to Magadan. <laughs> like, Man, I'm glad I made it to Magadan then, because I wouldn't want to get that label. So, uh, yeah, so, so I, I overhear that he's going to Magadan, and I'm like, well, I saw the bike he's on. I'm like, that's just as crappy as mine. This is like, and he's got to be pretty dumb like me to be doing this. I'm like, this is kind of a perfect batch. Really, it would be a perfect fit to ride it together. Because the last thing I'd want to do is hook up with a guy on a BMW GS. <laughs> uh, it'd be like a terrible match. He'd be pissed off, waiting for me the whole time. Like, it would never work. It would never work. So he leaves, and then I asked one of the guys, I'm like, hey, what's up with that guy? Like, did I hear right that he's headed to Magadan? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, let me get his phone number. So I sent him a message, and he's like, yeah, I'm headed there. I'm like, well, cool, what's your schedule? And he's like, I don't know, I don't really have one. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm like, well, where are you right now? He's like, oh, I'm not far from uh, uh, Baikal. So the, the big lake, you know, Lake Baikal. And um, I'm like, all right, cool. Well, I'm not either. You know, I'm also pretty close. So it took us a few days to actually connect. We kind of kept, like, not catching each other. But we finally ended up connecting. And um, we talked and we agreed that we would tackle this road together. Because he was kind of like me, too. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, I would kind of like to have somebody with me because I'm going to be breaking out a lot. And I was like, yeah, me too, man. Like, <laughs> it's going to take a village to get these two motorcycles down this road because neither one of these bikes was ever intended to be out here or ridden this far. Like, on paper, these are the worst choices. And he was actually, the only reason why he was out there was because his buddies, he's from Crimea, so he had a hell of a long ride too because Crimea to Magadan is a long ways. And he turned around and actually went back. Um, his buddies are all sitting around one day, and they have this, you know, piece of crap motorcycle. And they're like, ah, dude, no way you can ride that to Magadan. No way. And they bet him money. They're like, we'll give you like 100 rubles. Or I don't even know what the dollar amount was. Whatever the dollar amount was, that there's no way he could make that motorcycle get to Magadan. So sure shit, he did, man. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it literally was. And he and he'd never really, really even traveled before. So he was pretty new, new to motorcycle travel. He's a mechanic, thank God. Um, but so, it, man, like it really worked out because if I hadn't met him, I'm not sure if I would have done that. 
I mean, doing that by yourself is, uh, I don't know. I don't think I'd recommend it. <laughs> you kind of want a buddy for that stretch of road. But it's a road of bones, right? Yeah, yeah, but, but meeting him, like I said, we were just a perfect fit, because we were, we we're both having issues, like both kind of all constantly tinkering with our bikes to keep them, keep them alive. And we're both just crawling down the road because he's not moving fast with that trailer. And it's only like, you know, five horsepower, two stroke. I mean, top speed of 40 miles an hour anyway. <laughs> you know. So, like with the starter, you know, you're running the open road. Yeah. Did you bring extra parts for your stator or your motor or your charging system? I brought an entire complete charging system. Yeah. Okay. Regulator, okay. stator, rotor. Yeah, you're pulling a lot of dirt into it. Yeah. yeah, but, and dust actually was a pretty substantial problem. Um, and so like what I had done, I mean, there's not much you can do to really combat it. So I had made, basically I made three of them actually, uh, a filter cover, a sock basically to put on top of my air cleaner to try to like minimize how much dust was getting pulled into the motor. Um, but it was still pretty atrocious. Like when I changed my, my oil uh, before I, well last week, I finally got around to change my oil. And I hadn't changed it for like 9,000 miles because I couldn't find oil or filter. So I'm just adding oil and like not even good oil. It's whatever I can find. And I go to, and man, it like practically came out in chunks. It was bad, I pulled the dipstick out and it had sand and dirt on it. Like, oh man, this is. I called, the, I called the mechanic, actually, that had rebuilt that motor a couple years ago and apologized to him. I'm like, sorry, dude. I'm like, you put all this work into this thing and I just tortured it. I'm like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, he, now he has that as a testament on his website. Yeah, exactly, yeah. We'll stand up there. But there's not much you can do. I mean, what are you going to do? Right. You just keep, keep going. During the whole trip and oh, you just add whatever you can find. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't always no, no. So, what makes you decide to do this best bike by the Um, it's sort Which, of a. By the way, is really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it was just sort sort of a like a like I said earlier. It's just uh, when I when I sat down and thought, what's the biggest thing you can do on a motorcycle? Let's go around the world. And the and the and this road of bones was has been like a bucket list item forever. I'm what, like. What about the world? Yeah. You know, riding with your friends. Yeah, I mean, riding with with buddies and traveling with your friends is is awesome. I do enjoy that too. Um, but man, it's it's really hard to find somebody who's willing to go do this stuff and and is capable, like has the time and the means to do it. And I mean, it's hard enough to find somebody to take off for a week, yeah. let alone a year. Yeah. So. It's not necessarily even by choice. Like, I, yeah, I do love traveling by myself because it's super easy. I can do whatever I want, go wherever I want, and no one's going to question anything. Um, and I don't have to like convince somebody that it'll be okay to go up this road. Like, because normally my friends would be like, "Yeah, no, we're not going up that." I'd be like, oh, come on, it's fine. What is the name of your bike? I don't have one. Oh, no. No. Yeah, I never but named it. Yeah, it's been long enough now. So, on top of uh, the book, Roads to Run, yeah. you guys have to check out. Charlie has a, a blog where a lot of his, his travel stories are there. And he also writes for Cycle Tips Magazine. Fanta fantastic column he does for us every month. But I remember I remember the, the title of the article that sometimes going home is the hardest part. Uh -huh. So the, the trials and tribulations didn't stop once you got yeah. Uh, let's see. What part are you ref are you referring to? Something specific, or just in uh, general? Just, just fatigue. fatigue? <laughs> yeah, that's actually a real thing. Yeah, that's a real thing. Because um, it really starts to catch up to you. Um, it's one thing to leave for a few weeks or even a few months, but when you start getting into that, like six months plus, man, like. Like you really have to start taking days off the bike and just not do anything because mm -hmm. it really starts to wear on you. 
And then you, you know, you're constantly going through time changes, different time zones. Um, and it's really hard to keep a schedule. And, you know, especially more so like in the winter time when it's, you know, colder than hell and you're fighting the elements all day. Yeah, it, it adds, it, it wears on you. Yeah. But there was, uh, even at the very end, you ended up getting, getting home way before the motorcycle did. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a whole that was a whole fiasco in Mexico trying to get that bike. Um, yeah, I ended up down to Mexico in Manzanillo for a month trying to get that thing out of customs. Um, total pain in the neck, uh, but obviously I got it. Um, it's here, but yeah, coming off the road is, and I've I've gone through this before, so I, I like I know to anticipate it. Um, it's, it's very abrupt <laughs> change in lifestyle all of a sudden because you, you just spent the last year or six months or however long the trip is um, waking up, get on your bike, go somewhere, see people, do whatever. But then all of a sudden you pull in your garage and you're just like done. And for me, I really have to like fight to not get super depressed and you really start plummeting, right? And you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> and you're just sitting around, and you're like, and it's, man, it's hard. It's, dude, it's tough. Like coming here was kind of good because I've been home for two months. <laughs> and uh, so coming here was good because like Randy's like, bring the bike. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, we're gonna go somewhere. <laughs> but you know, it'd be cool if you did the show in the summer so it wasn't so cold. <laughs> Make it easier to get here. I, I love the fact that you're still kind of traveling without a plan, though, because you got here, they put the bike inside, and you're like, shit, I can't get to the hotel now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, luckily, there's a bunch of amazing people that have been helping me. <laughs> so. How did you have to break the bike down? I saw some pictures in the magazine. I really just, yeah, like, crazy. yeah, so shipping it to Europe, I uh, didn't have to take anything apart. They just oh, really? created the whole thing just like it is. Didn't even have to drain fluids or anything. It was super easy. Um, but to ship it to Mexico, uh, had to drain all the fluids, and then really just pulled the front end off. Okay, that, I guess that's the picture I saw in the magazine. Yeah, it yeah. It looked like it was short. Right, just trying to make that crate as small as possible. So it looks, I think, maybe worse than it is. But yeah, just pull the front end off, and it's not really that big of a deal. It was kind of a pain in the neck to get it back together because they just dropped the box in the dirt parking lot. And of course, there's no, I have no lift. And, you know, this crate, you know, is like put together with like 6,000 nails, you know, and you're trying to pry it open with a screwdriver this long because you have no real good tools for this stuff. And actually, the crate actually at one point fell out of the truck because it showed up on a, in a pickup truck and uh, in, to a dirt parking lot. Like, we have no lift, we have no forklift. And this, between the bike, all the gear, and the crate, this is easily probably a thousand pounds. And so it was just me and this dude and his kid, and we're like, how are we gonna get this thing out of here? So we ended up tying a toe strap around the crate, uh, and then the other end around a palm tree, and then driving the truck out from underneath it, which seemed like an okay idea. <laughs> It, well, it, 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 it fell out and turned on end is what happened. Oh, right. <laughs> and then... It was about that stupid. And then we just pushed it over and just let it fall. And then they just like drive off. And we're like, okay, see ya. So now I'm out there trying to like tear this crate open. And then, you know, I can't get the front end on because I need to elevate the bike to get the front end on, but I have no lift, no nothing. So I'm like finding, basically finding rocks and things, pieces of wood that I can cram underneath it. And then as people walk by, I'd recruit them to help me. <laughs> like, hey, come here, come here. Like, pull, pull, pull. And they like lift, and I'd jam a rock under it, and then put the bike together. And, uh, and then, of course, I have to wait for somebody else to walk by to now take that rocks and stuff out from underneath it. Yeah, it was a... <laughs> a lot of people have thought about doing what you've done, myself included. 
Yeah. And you did it for the kids. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. would say just leave the door and get going really because I mean yeah there's not like you can't plan it too much and it's really not that much planning that has to be done in the first place like it I think a lot of people think that it requires a monumental amount of planning ahead and there really isn't because the only things you got to do is figure out how to get your bike across the ocean which isn't hard because you just call a shipping company and they're gonna walk you through everything. Like it's really straightforward. Um, and then, you know, once you, once you get across, it, yeah, just open the map and get going. And, you know, a lot of people I think are really concerned about border crossings, same thing. They just show up to the border, I'm like, what do you need from me? And they'll tell you what you need. And if you don't have it, it's available at the border. You know, if you need a special kind of insurance, or special document, it's gonna be available there. So it's not like you even need to like plan ahead for that stuff. The only thing you would need to think about would be, uh, are you going into a country that requires a visa and make sure you have that before you leave the US? Because most of the time you can't get those from a foreign country. You have to be in your home country. But uh, honestly, I think it's consider considerably simpler than people think. The hardest part is just stepping out the front door and getting going. Everything else will take care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Well, listen, again, on behalf of everybody right here, for your investment in the, uh, in, in the spirit of all of this, you know, honestly, trust me, yourself, and bringing us to all of us, thank you so much. Of course. And take, take some time to get to know this guy. Pick up his book. Follow along on his journey and and do do like you said, all it takes is <coughs> one foot in front of the other and go after it. That's it. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Done. <laughs> cool. Yeah, thank you.